Hey guys, it is Mr. Van Lowe, and I'm going to give you a quick lecture on topic 10.1. I've broken topic 10.1 into two lessons. Uh, the first lesson um, has the following learning objectives. First, you will be able to represent sources of mass and charge, as well as lines of electric and gravitational force and field patterns using appropriate symbolism. Second, you will be able to solve problems involving gravitational electric fields, and this will, of course, involve a handout. So, first, let's take a look at gravitational fields. Later on, we will move into electric fields. I'm going to give you a formula. Here it is. A gravitational field around any object with mass will be given by this equation where G is equal to uh, big G times big M divided by R squared. Uh, and that big G is, of course, the gravitational field strength. Um, sorry, big G is the gravitational constant. Uh, and this is in your data booklet. I've given the value here, but you should be aware that you can look it up easily. Uh, R is the distance to the object with mass, and of course small g is gravitational field strength. On Earth, this would be, of course, 9.81 meters per second squared, approximately. Okay, uh, just a key point here. The source of our gravitational field is going to be our object with mass, given by the large m there. <clears throat> So uh, this diagram here shows field lines around an object with mass, and we have here a radial pattern. You should note that the field lines are perpendicular to this round surface. Okay, and if we zoom in to that surface, uh, we can't see the curvature anymore, but the field lines are still perpendicular. Okay, so. Here we have gravitational potential energy. Uh, this diagram is showing that, where we have two masses. Uh, one is given by the large M, the uppercase M, and the other mass is given by the small M. So what's happening here is we're taking our small body and we're moving it closer to the larger body. And the distance between them initially is considered infinite. Okay, so uh, what we call gravitational potential energy is simply the amount of work required to move these two bodies closer together from an infinite distance. And this is one of those definitions that you probably need to be able to remember. So you might consider making a note card and just uh, memorizing it flat out. Okay, the work done to move the bodies closer together, and therefore the gravitational potential energy, will be given by this equation. Uh, and we'll define all those variables here in a second. So uh, because of the fact that the force is going to be changing and it's not constant as our objects move closer together, we need calculus to derive the equation. Uh, the calculus is given on page 397. This is not a calculus-based based course, so you don't need to know it, but uh, if you want to take a look, go ahead and look it up on page 397. Um, note that we have a negative sign here, and that's just telling us the direction of force. In this case, gravitational force is attractive, but when we look at electric force, you will note that it could be repulsive or attractive, and if the objects are repelled, then that negative sign would be a positive sign. So the negative sign is telling us that we have an attractive force. Okay, just defining our variables here quickly. Large M is a larger mass. Small M is a smaller mass. Uh, big G is a gravitational constant, which again, you can find in the data booklet. And R is the distance between objects or radius. Uh, one key point there, is that the distance between objects is center to center, okay? The center of mass, if we wanna be really specific. Okay, 
This equation is not in the data booklet. Okay, so just be aware of that. All right, so the gravitational potential at a point P in a gravitational field is the work done per unit mass in bringing a small point mass, M, from infinity to point P. And you need to know this basically word for word. So put it on a flashcard, memorize it, uh, know it, love it, learn it, do not forget it. Okay, luckily we can express this mathematically, which uh, might be easier to memorize. And that looks like this. So gravitational potential, uh, which we've described here as V sub G, is equal to work divided by mass. Okay, the data booklet rearranges this slightly. And the data book version looks like this. Okay, so if you look up subtopic 10.1, you will find this equation. Okay, so uh, what is this diagram about? So the amount of work done on an object is independent of the path taken. It is also a scalar quantity, which means uh, it's not a vector, right? So there's no direction uh, given for the amount of work done. All that we're considering here is the change in potential energy from points A and B. And that change uh, is solely dependent on the distance between objects. And we've, we've seen the formula uh, involving a radius on a previous slide. Okay, so be aware. Electric field strength is determined by measuring the force on our test charge Q. Um, if we wanted to, we could also consider uh, test mass in the case of our gravitational field. So it's not, it's not a bad way to think about it. Uh, however, uh, <clears throat> specifically for electrical objects, we are concerned with uh, test charges. So we're measuring the force on a test charge Q, which we want to be as small as possible and is also generally positive. Okay, so there it is. Electric field strength, E, is equal to force divided by Q. And by substituting, substituting Coulombic force and uh, then simplifying the equation, we will get electric field strength is equal to Coulomb's constant times uh, big Q divided by radius squared. And this is all review from topic five. And remember that big Q is the charge of the object um, whose electric field we are trying to measure. Okay, the little q there on the screen is uh, the charge of the test charge. And this is all review from topic five, so uh, if any of it is a little confusing, you might consider going back and uh, just flipping through your notes or reading the text. Okay, so... Um, quick rundown of the variables here. I'm not going to read them because you guys can read and you can always pause the video if you need to, which is one of the advantages of lecturing this way. Okay, definition time. A dipole has two equal and opposite charges separated by a distance a. So you can see our two equal and opposite charges in this diagram. They are Q and negative Q. If we then measure uh, the electric field strength at uh, point P, what we're going to find is that we have two electric fields, okay? The electric field from the positive charge and the electric field from the negative charge. And the total electric field at point P will be given by a sum of the vectors. Okay, and this again is review from topic five. Uh, if you need to review vector addition, you can click on this link and you will find the document that I generated uh, at the beginning of the year when we were studying topic five. So if you wanna take a look, go ahead. In this particular case, uh, you'll note that the horizontal components 
have an equal magnitude. Uh, and so the horizontal components of these two vectors are going to cancel out. And that means that calculating the vertical, remaining vertical component is a little bit easier. Um, the reason why they're equal is because uh, both charges are an equal distance from point P. So this may not always be the case. We can get uh, more complicated examples if we want to. Okay, so here we have the diagram for electric potential energy. And this should look very familiar, should look just like what's happening with gravitational potential energy. And in fact, there are a lot of parallels and that's why uh, we teach them at the same time in topic 10. So electric poten potential energy, definition time, is the amount of work done to move two charged bodies closer together from, again, an infinite distance. Okay, so definition time. The electric potential at a point P in an electrical field is the work done per unit charge and bringing a small positive test charge Q from infinity to point P. And we have shown that in the previous diagram. Uh, you do need to memorize this definition. It is a very, very important that you are able to write it out um, on your own. Luckily, again, we have an equation, though, that will express uh, this relationship minus some of the context, uh, and it looks like this. So electric, electric potential is defined as V subscript E, and that is equal to the work done uh, moving a small positive test charge from an infinite distance divided by the value of that charge. Again, your data booklet has a slightly rearranged version where work done is equal to the charge, small positive test charge, times the electric potential, or in this case, the change in electric potential. Oh, I need to reanimate this slide. Okay, that happens sometimes, so let me just show you everything. Uh, the electric potential again, is going to vary uh, by radius, uh, vary by distance between the objects. And that gives us kind of a tidy way to think about it. I've combined our equations here on the bottom where the change in electric potential is equal to the change in work, which is equal to Coulomb's constant times uh, the product of our two charges divided by a change in radius. So really, uh, those three things on the top of the fraction there, Coulomb's constant and those two charges, those are gonna remain constant. So the only thing that can really ch change here is the distance between the charged objects. And so what this tells us then is that uh, work is going to be inversely proportionate to distance. And obviously the electric potential will then also be inversely proportionate to distance between the objects. Oh good, this one is animated properly. Very excited. Okay, uh, here we have elect electric potential and this diagram is exactly the same diagram as the previous one. And again, uh, the path here doesn't matter. The work done is going to equal uh, the work done is dependent on the change in distance between our two objects here, okay? So we're moving our smaller object from point A to point B, and the path involved doesn't matter. Well, the only thing that matters is the change in distance. Okay, so here we see a diagram that shows two charged objects. And because electric potential is scalar, in this case, we can just add the electric potential from each object. Um, this is nice. We don't have to engage in vector addition, uh, which is quite a bit uh, more complicated. Just involves more steps. It's not necessarily harder, just more steps involved. Um, so in any case, the sum 
of the electric potentials from Q1 and Q2 at point P will just look like this. And again, we don't have to worry about sine or cosine or blah, 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 which we would have to deal with um, if these were vectors. But because they're not, life is easier. Okay, so knowing when to use vector addition and when to use just regular addition is going to be important. So do make a note. You don't want to mistakenly attempt uh, to add vectors here when you don't need to. It's gonna give you the wrong answer and it's time consuming. Okay, uh, so we can map an electric potential field as a surface um, and you can do this with a gravitational field as well. And some of you who enjoy this sort of thing may actually have seen uh, gravity wells expressed this way. So in any case, uh, this, this surface is showing us a positive charge and a negative charge. And the positive charge is just the, the big bump there. And the negative charge would be the divot in this surface. So I don't think you will need to worry about this too much for IB physics, but if you keep studying uh, electrical fields in university, then uh, this sort of thing is going to become a much bigger deal. Okay, next we have here electric potential uh, inside of a sphere, okay? So we have here a positively charged sphere of radius r. And you can see that what happens is we go from zero to r. So if we're measuring the electric potential inside the sphere, what you will find is that it's constant, okay? So if you place a test charge inside the sphere and measure the electric potential at any point inside the sphere, you're going to get the same value. And uh, the mathematics involved here are a little bit complex. Uh, again, if you go on to university, you will, you will study them. You don't need to know the math for DP physics. All you need to know is that inside the sphere, the electric potential is constant. And then when we get outside the sphere, our electric uh, potential is going to vary inversely with radius, as you can see, uh, as our line goes from a constant to a curve. Okay, we've already covered that. And we've covered that. All right, next, here we have a negatively charged sphere. And it's just a mirror image of the positively charged example. Okay, so that does it for my lecture. We will continue uh, lecturing in our next lesson. And what you should do now is work some problems and I will have shared a handout with you and you will be able to do that. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. And if you don't have any questions, then carry on with your handout.